back to Let's Chat with Tita Grincy, only here on V81 Radio. Okay, and we're back with Michael Williams. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Williams is our guest tonight, and he has been in the theater scene here in the Philippines for quite some time. And he started his career <laughs> in the 80s. And uh, what was it like to <clears throat> under the great Bebot Amador, Michael? Well, you know, uh, all the rumors about her are true. <laughs> she, she, can be ter- she can be tyrannical. Um, she was very, um, very clear about what she wanted, and she knew how to get it, right? So you have to be ready to um, work with her, and she's she's very extreme. So uh, I guess also because of the time, um, she was creating a theater industry where there was hardly any. 1982, you know, when I started with her. They started in 1970, I think 1970. Um, yeah, because I remember last year, was it last year when Rep celebrated its 50th anniversary? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, or a year before. But she, um, they started, they started working out of their Volkswagen. Their office was in their Volkswagen. And that's how they built that, that, theater company, Repertory Philippines, was built like that. And, you know, um, she had to fight every inch of the way to create um, that theater company, which was uh, became very popular, um, very well attended, and they created a lot of uh, productions. They had uh, 12 shows a year. That's a and, show every uh, month. When you start, yeah, so 12 shows in a year. Yeah. There were two One seasons a year. Major production a month. Yeah, that was two two seasons a year. Each each season was five shows, um, and they have one musical that was in the small theater, which was Insular Life at that time, and then they had a big musical outside, which is usually either at the um, Rizal Theater, which is now the Shangri La Hotel, um, yes, or the Metropolitan Theater or the CCP. Um, yes. So, you know, if you were if you were a uh, a regular uh, a regular in her theater company, like you're a a, a stable a part of the stable of actors um, that's held in repertory, then you were employed the whole year round. And um, so, what was life like? Wow, you would be absorbed every day. Yeah. You um, in the theater. Apart from the theater shows that we would do. There would be noontime shows for places like Cafe Alvarado, you know. Um, uh, and um, what would happen is, like, on a, on a weekday, I would wake up at noon because I'm tired from the night before, right? Wake up at noon, rush to our office. A, that was in Land Bank before, I remember. And I would go around with the stage manager to help collect props. So we do our rounds, we pick up our furniture for the next show, our props and whatnot. And then we go back to the office um, before four or five for the rehearsal of the next play. And then we would rehearse till about 6.30 or 6.45. And then we would hot foot it, we would run from Land Bank to Insular Life Building and do the That's quite a run. And do the 8 p.m. show. So the minute you get there, you're eating your sandwich, putting on your makeup, changing into your costume, getting ready, uh, and then zeroing down, calming yourself down, centering Mm -hmm. yourself before you go on and do the evening show. And then you do that again the next day. Um, What a commitment. And then on the weekends. Yeah. And then on on the weekends, we would have uh, uh, like a, a, a lunchtime show at, like I said, maybe... Uh, Calle Cinco or Cafe Alvarado, we would do a, an 11 o'clock performance. It's a, like a spoof sketches and songs to entertain the lunch crowd. And then the, as soon as that is finished, I would rush to the rehearsal in the Land Bank building and then do the evening show at night. And that's the way uh, life was for us. Sometimes on a matinee day, we would have rehearsals between shows. So we would show, we would do a performance in a matinee, uh, a three o'clock show. We will end at, let's say, what, uh, six. 
We would have a really quick meal between, and then a couple of minutes to rest. We will do the corporate rehearsal. We're doing a launch of some soap or something. We will rehearse there, and then we'll finish at uh, in enough time to put on the refresh the makeup for the evening show. So we were constantly working, and it was a great life. I learned so much. But that <clears throat> tremendous experience as a young man, as, yeah. a, as a professional actor in yes. the early 80s, uh, yeah. was really a tremendous way to build your foundation as an actor. And your strength. You yes, know, and your resilience, physically correct. Physically capable of doing that, you know? Um, yes. So you learn, you learn to sing through a sore throat, you learn to sing through a cold, you learn to sing through a headache. You learn to sing through almost anything. And since you were in repertory, you were like a trap. You were like a family, very close. Oh yeah. Together. Oh yeah. We were like we were like siblings, all of us. We were like like we were really close. We were really family. We eat together. And we eat every single yeah. day. Yeah. And she was she was she lorded every. She was the Tita Bebot who was yeah. like your second parent. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> So she, and, and she she is actually my artistic she and and um, baby Barado, they're both my art they're my artistic parents. Yes, but prior to your joining rep, did you ever train to be an actor? Did you study um, to be interested <laughs> in acting at all? I have a, I have a funny story. <clears throat> in in school, I was always singing. I'm in the glee club, you know. I'm singing the national anthem in the quadrangle, you know, on the first day of the week. Um, I was in the elementary drama club. And then I auditioned for the high school theater guild. And um, I didn't make it. They turned me down. <laughs> <laughs> they, they turned me down. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was always performing. I was part of our, our glee club and, and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And uh, when you started with repertory, were you given lead roles right away? Oh, no, no. So uh, you had to work your way through yeah. the courts and through the, yes. you know, yeah. all the way to the top. What was that like? Getting the, the people. I was in the ensemble uh, for my first show. I did... I did uh, the first show that I ever got into was uh, called A Woman of the Year, Woman of the Year. Um, and that played in um, Rizal Theater. And I auditioned for that and another musical that was going up. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. But oh. they got me for the big musical. And uh, they liked my work there. And then uh, an opening popped up in the season show, the one in Insider Life. And they put me in the in the season play right away. So I was a support role in uh, a in a straight when well, it's actually a a French translation. La Dame Don, it's a flea in her ear, uh, which was a you know it's it's these one of these comedies with you know um, mistaken identity. You know all these different doors, people running in and out. It's certainly funny. I totally enjoyed myself. And then from that point on, it was support role, support role, lead role. And then within a year, I was doing uh, a lot of the romantic, comic, comic, comedic roles um, by virtue of the fact that I'm, I guess I'm funny and that I could sing. So, yes, that's a, that's a very good combination. You're funny and yeah. you can sing. So, <laughs> and you can so, dance. <laughs> and I can dance. So, so yeah, I got, and, I got all those roles. And then, and then um, you know, as you go along, you get... You get trained. You get yelled at. You get, you know, for being um, silly, for being indirect, for being impractical, for being, I don't know, whatever. So I, I got screamed at a lot. <laughs> I, I, I heard that um, there was one time that uh, you were trying to sing something and uh, Bibot Amador got angry at you and uh, she asked if you, were, if you were singing like Barbara Streisand. Yeah, yeah. She goes, she what, goes what, can you refresh my memory? What's that? Uh, I, was, I was trying to sing um, the song 
of the character in a beautiful way. Because it, to me, it sounded beautiful, right? But I wasn't necessarily singing in character. But what she wants above all and all the time is for you to be in character. So here I was singing, making that song sound beautiful. And she goes, stop singing like that. You're not Barbara Streisand. And me and my sense of humor, I go, I'm not. And who am I? Of course, the entire I cast, died to cry. <laughs> the entire cast broke down laughing. I, I guess she found it funny, but you couldn't tell because she was angry, you know, at the time. <laughs> so, so I got it for that. So you you went you did the straight plays and you did musicals. Uh, yes. What were your most memorable uh, musicals during the eight? You know, um, I, I like musicals for several reasons, and I, I choose. I I, I have favorites um, for different reasons, either because the music is absolutely beautiful, or. I had a memorable experience performing in that musical uh, or um, the musical as a whole uh, was very moving to me in a particular way. So, but, but there's so many of them, you know. Uh, I love Carousel for the song, If I Loved You. And that for me was very uh, important because I realized, wow, you only really have a finite time in the world. And I don't want to be caught in the position where the character found himself that he hadn't taken the time to tell the people that he loved how he loved them. And it was wow. always this supposition in his head. So from that moment on, I was like a fiend telling everybody how I loved them, right? <laughs> it was this... I, I, went, I, mean, I went a little bit overboard, but you know that 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 yeah. was how much I was moved by that that musical. You know, I and have then, a short anecdote about that show Carousel, because I I spent my my growing up years studying in Saint Paul's, Manila, and Father Reuter. Yes, that was early productions, and I used to stay really late waiting for my sister to get uh, uh to get dismissed. And I would spend every day inside the theater in the dark watching Father Reuter rehearse Carousel because we had one major production every year in the Fleur de Lis Theater of St. Paul's. And that play, I was so frustrated because I saw all the rehearsals until the dress rehearsals, but I never got to see the real play. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I was always looking at, because Father Reuter had this place on, you know, on top. And he would be, you know, giving directions. Uh, and that's those are the years when I, you know, I, I sort of like was so enamored and so intrigued by this whole idea of theater. And, you know, um, and I know that you guys in rep, you had to undertake not just stage roles, but you had to do other things as well in the production, oh, yeah. right? Well, um, Bibot's um Zenaida Amador, um, her 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 vision was to create a viable career path for young artists like myself. Uh, but sometimes that's not easy to do. Look, for example, your theater company will do a show that features only women. What happens to the men, right? So there's a musical called Nonsense, for example, which is all about nuns, right? Um, and there aren't any male roles. So how does she employ you but she will find a way. So I was stage manager, or I was uh, helping out with the lights, uh, running the board, helping out with the microphones, or I was um, working in the front of house, selling tickets, selling programs. And she would pay me for those things, but nominal payment. But at yes. least I was employed. I was still connected to the theater. And I didn't have to look for employment outside. I had a little bit of money that kept me engaged it allowed me to stay there and and um every year that you stay uh she increases your wages so you know if you're two seasons you get so much more third season you get a little bit more and she she rewarded that kind of uh a, a kind of loyalty that you would show the company at the same time you yeah, learn she so almost, much. yeah and, and it, it everyone i talk to in the theater business here and and i've worked with quite a number of you guys 
you know, it seems like there's this awe, this like cult following, and you know, they would always uh, you know, uh, talk uh, um, about their memories and their memorable moments with with Dibot Amador, and she's really instrumental in putting the theater industry of the Philippines, yeah, you know, in in, in good direction, right? Well, well, there were two theater companies, and we consider these two theater companies consider themselves sister companies. PETA started, uh, Philippine Educational Theater Association, uh, uh, started the same time as uh, Repertory did, um, but they took two different paths, right? Um, Repertory decided to be more commercial, uh, do uh, a lot of Americana, Neil Simon's comedies. They did a lot of, they did their, their share of classics as well. They did Shakespeare, uh, Moliere, they did a lot of the, the French uh, translations. And um, they, she worked her theater that way. And, um, and Peta did their own educative, more, you know, topical material. Uh, but yeah, yeah she, she created, they created a, a, a strong theater going audience. Yes, and also, so um, that very well-rounded approach to your foundation and your growth as an actor uh, sort of had a turning point towards the late 80s when the whole Miss Saigon yeah. phenomenon descended yeah. on, and you were all right for the picking. So, and yeah. what was that like? Uh, the leap um, from theater to london um that was 1988 i think when the first round of auditions happened um and uh, we were all informed that it was you know the big producer that did all these shows and we were all very very excited to go and audition we went i auditioned uh we were doing i was doing um little shop of horrors at that time and it was already at the tail end of the run and it was such a big hit that show for us, and I was—I already had no more voice. I was totally like, you know, I was warming up. I was vocalizing with a cup of coffee just to heat myself up um, almost every day towards the weekend. But on the day that I auditioned, I actually had laryngitis and pharyngitis. And uh, I remember Claude Michel coming up to me, going, uh, "Can you hit this note? Uh, what about this note?" About that note, and I go that note. I can hit that note on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and then they made me sing, <laughs> and, and I sang uh, my favorite song, uh, "Something's Coming" from West Side Story. And uh, West Side he Story. Let, yeah, he let me finish that song, and then uh, soon enough, I found out I was part of the cast. So that was wonderful. Um, yes. He, uh, the, the 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 funny thing is, you know, like I was telling you earlier, the the work routine for us was heavy, right? We would work the rehearsal in the afternoon, the evening show. We would do those other event uh, rehearsals between. So we were constantly working. But when we got to London, I remember the other Filipinos and I and Junix were saying, wow, we're only doing the one show? <laughs> so it seems like... <laughs> It seemed like it was a little bit, it was simplified for us, but we were there, you know, it was nine to five. We were there in the morning doing a warm up, um, getting ourselves physically ready for this very difficult show. Um, and we were there the whole day. And what was it like uh, uh, at that time with, uh, you know, you joining, uh, that was that your first time to join an international cast? Yes, that was the first time for me to join uh, an international cast uh, and to actually fly out uh, to perform. And I remember, and I remember walking into the Drury Lane Theater, and it was the most, the most beautiful theater I'd ever seen. I mean, it was gilt, it's gold, red, big, and ornate, and and beautiful, and it was just an amazing experience. So it was like a. It was really a turning point in your career. And uh, how many years did you spend in London to perform I, for the cast? Of I did uh, Miss Saigon for a year. 
And then I was taken to do the romantic lead, Lunta, in The King and I, also in the West End. And then and then also to do a tour. Uh, with so you toured uh, the UK? Yes. And you went uh, we also also went to Scotland. Uh, did We did um, Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, and then uh, that, that tour almost uh, ran for almost a year or so. So what a what a leap. So from Manila, from Repertory Philippines, you joined the Miss Saigon cast. And after a year, you toured the UK. Um, yeah. And how did that, you change? The, how, what, uh, what by the way, biggest change for you? Yeah. By the way, that The King and I was uh, produced by uh, the Hammerstein Estate. Uh, that, that show spearheaded the centenary celebration of Rogers and Hammerstein, uh, oh, and, and yeah. I was the first. I was the first Oriental Asian to ever play that role. Prior to to that, prior to me, it was always Hispanic, uh, some Hispanic person, uh, you know, or and to or think Latin that Luka is supposed to be a an Asian, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, so, it, it was. It, I mean, that's one of the things that I wanted to do. I mean, everybody, every actor would want to do a a, a performance in the West End, right? Or on Broadway, yeah. right? So I was able to do the West End twice, uh, but I was also to, able to do a lead role in the West End, which is what, yeah. um, you know, I wanted to do for for myself. And yeah, so for, for my father too, I wanted to uh, to dedicate a lead role to him. So... Uh, I, I was able to do that. And, wow! Uh, and um, yeah. it was really a turning point, and and you your career went. Oh, you know, uh, little did you know that that really made a tremendous impact in your professional life as an yeah. actor. Yes. And, and there's really nothing like getting out of your comfort zone and performing in an environment that's completely different from. From you know your yes. country of but, living you know, and working oddly, there. Oddly, oddly, um, when you get into the theater and you're working backstage with other actors, it's not really that different. You know, actors the world over are exactly the same. <laughs> we have really? the same. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, we have the same objectives. We have the same hang-ups sometimes. You know. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're cut from the same bolt of cloth, in, in other words, and you yes. kind of, you get along with them because you understand them. So, um, it was different because I was in a different country and there are cultural things. Um, but you know, the, the cast of Miss Saigon was a, was a melting pot. We had, we had Vietnamese people, we had French people, we had Malaysian people, we had, uh. We had Japanese people, we had Filipinos, we had uh, Americans, we had the, the British people. Um, it, it was a multinational, uh, multiracial company. So it's, it was it was fascinating. Yes, and um, when you were so with uh, with, I'm sure that there were shows. So you met dignitaries. Did you meet the Queen? I didn't meet the Queen. I met Princess Diana. Wow. Um, it was the Princess Fund uh, performance. And I remember, oh, she was gorgeous. She was tall and she had a, she had on a beautiful um, um, blue, um, baby blue dress. It, she, was, um, she was really a princess. Gorgeous. And she had, um, she went, she, she, you know, we were in a line and she came to shake our hand and and I was listening to what she was saying to the other people, and she never had anything stuck. She really had a genuine interest in the people she was talking to, and and um, she never ran out of things to say to people. And um, you feel like well, she's really interested in you. What a wonderful woman! Wow, I mean, really, um, all the experiences and exposure, and yes. all of the learning that you, you derived from that time of your life. And uh, it became, you know, it, it really molded you and helped you grow further in your yeah. career. Yeah. And added to your list of uh, of faces in that last PowerPoint. Because you have <laughs> yeah. roles over 
over a decade and a half, I, if I remember yeah. your bio, more than a hundred. And I was thinking, how is that mathematically possible for one person to do more than a hundred roles in about 15 years? Wow. Yeah, you know, it's really funny because uh, <laughs> the, the, when you're doing a show every month, okay, month after month after month, you, you, you kind of become really aware of yourself and how you are similar in a way to the role that you did for or the one you're doing now. So you make more of, more of an effort to, to find that thing that makes that character different from this character and expound on that, right? So whether it be an internal thing or an external thing, you do everything you can. So I guess that's why people always say, oh, you're always changing the way you look. But that's um, part of the the job. You have to, yes, you have yes. to, you have to assume an entirely different persona. And that includes the way you, I don't know, part your hair or, you know, wear your shirt. I don't know. So all those things. So I have all these different pictures of me looking like not me, you know. I once went. I once once I, I once did a show. Um, I did um, I did Scrooge. And, yes, I remember. Um, yeah, Christmas Carol, and uh, and my mom. I said, my mom, mom, come and watch this show because she likes this story. Um, she was she was seventy or something, or yeah, seventy plus at the time. So she went to watch the show, and then um, of course she had her own car, and I was you know. And then the next day, she was so mad at me. She goes, I went all the way over there to watch that show because you said you were in it. I didn't even see you there. <laughs> Mom, I was there. Where were you? I was Scrooge. That was you? You know, <laughs> so she was. And I went, yes, she did recognize me. So, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Well, um, Truly, um, you know, you're a man of many characters. You've evolved as a character. You've been on stage, off stage, as a director, as a technical person within the theater. You've worked front of house, so you know how to yeah. run. <laughs> and you know, all of that prepared you for your current role. No? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, artistic director for the Resorts World Manila. Ladies and gentlemen, when we return more on Michael Williams uh, and uh, his continuing odyssey as an actor and now an artistic director. We'll be back shortly with Tita Gracie. Let's chat with Tita Gracie only here on V81 Radio.